Uh, good evening, dear Professor uh, Makram Makhoul. Thank you very much indeed for these very kind words addressed to my uh, humble person. Lords, your eminence, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, good evening to all of you. I'm delighted indeed to be presenting my keynote speech today at the second Euroxy Syria International Conference held by the European Center for the Study of Extremism and the esteemed educational heritage of Cambridge. I understand that Euroxy, the European Center for the Study of Extremism, has been running a unique program about Syria in the last five years. However, it seems that it has neither been easy in the UK, even for British institutions, to be conducting a free and fair dialogue, nor hold a track to diplomacy and break media blockade in the UK and Europe. Therefore, I highly appreciate and thank the center, its patrons, lords, baronesses, and ambassadors, and academic boards. And I'm delighted to be extending my sincere and special thanks to all those who worked hard to make the whole of Syria program Syrian program at Euroxy and this particular conference are reality against all odds. In particular, it gives me a great pleasure to be thanking the director of the, of the Euroxy and the convener of this esteemed conference, Professor Dr. Makram Khouri Makhoul, for his resilience, restless and genuine effort. Allow me at the outset to emphasize that in Syria, we depart always from the holy book of international diplomacy and international relations, which is the charter of the United Nations. This holy book calls for the respect of sovereignty, unity, territorial integrity, and non-interference in the internal affairs of member states. As you all know, Syria is a founding member of the United Nations. We have always been an integral part of the international legitimacy. With clear words, we are not a newcomer to the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, discussing a thorny topic such as the European Syrian relations and the current negative role of Europe in the crisis in Syria will undoubtedly take us all take us all to horizons steeped in history and geography, and will push us towards many questions that are not easy to find unanimous answers to. Is Europe an unknown for us, the Syrians? Are we, the Syrians, unknown to Europe? Definitely, the answer is no. Geographically, we, the Syrians, are among the closest countries and nations to the European continent, a factor that has increased our interaction over ages. Historically, interaction and exchange between Syria and Europe were never interrupted in one day, nor one era, but rather a continuous process that contributed with all its pros and cons in drawing the region's map and its role on the global stage. Culturally, culturally speaking, the reciprocal process has existed throughout the ages and its fingerprints are present in both regions. Stories of seven emperors of the Roman Empire from Syria itself, such as Julia Dumna and Philip the Arab, were not just a strange coincidence, nor is it a coincidence that the most beautiful architecture that Rome boasts today, the Pantheon, is designed and implemented by the Syrian engineer Apollodor of Damascus. The Syrians had a great role in civilization and culture, East and West, and this civilized role was demonstrated by being a bridge between ancient Greece and the West. History tells 
us that at least four of the popes are of Syrian origin. Saint Paul set out from Damascus to spread Christianity in Europe. In front of the House of Justice building in Rome stands a statue of the Syrian jurist Babinian. He is described by the figure who has given a lot in the field of law and legislation in Europe. Some may not know that the name of this continent came, Europe I mean, came from Syria, Europe. A name means broad face, is the daughter of Agenor, the Phoenician king of Tyre city. According to Greek mythology, it is claimed that the continent of Europe was named after the Phoenician princess Europe. And her picture is printed today on the two euro coin. The equation tends towards saying that a lot brings us together and that Syria has offered a lot to Europe. So what happened? Where did the mistakes happen? And why did the EU no longer have independence in dealing with the situation in Syria? and prefer to rotate in the American orbit. What have we, the Syrians, done for Europe to deal with us unfairly and unjustifiably? Are we, the Syrians, the cause of the two world wars which resulted in the bloodshed of hundreds of millions of victims and full destruction of the globe? Did we as Syrians had a colonial record in the European continent? Are we the Syrians who had plotted the Sykes-Picot agreement to divide countries and plant Israel in the heart of Europe? Have we the Syrians created armed, bloody, moderate oppositions in Europe? Have we the Syrians funded separatist European militias in Corsica, the Basque, in Britain and Scotland? Have we imposed sanctions on European leaders and their families and their ministers of foreign affairs? Have we pushed Germany against the United Kingdom or France against the Netherlands or Germany against Spain? Are we the ones who had allowed extremists or facilitated their smuggling to Europe through the Turkish border? Are we the ones who had funded, trained, and supported ISIS and its affiliated terrorist entities to destroy Paris, Berlin, Madrid, Brussels, and Rome? Are we the ones who have imposed unilateral coercive economic measures and suffocated economic blockade on the European peoples? Are we the ones who hold regular donor conferences for EU without prior consultation with the European continents? Are we the ones who politicize the refugee file and submit to the blackmail practiced by the Turkish authorities in order not to throw millions of Syrians into the Mediterranean? Are we the ones who spend billions of euros on European refugees in neighboring countries in order to prevent them from returning back home? Many, many questions that need fair answers, but above all, they need the political will and the moral stand of the European Union in order to put a definitive and unconditional end to Syrian sufferings. Our suffering is genuine, ladies and gentlemen, and should not be reduced to a mere rhetoric said by Josep Borrell, the High Commissioner. Some countries celebrate these days what they call the 10th anniversary of the Syrian conflict. The EU adopted last Thursday a resolution that makes Europe a part of the problem rather than a part of the solution. The resolution is biased and genuine and takes side against the Syrian government in flagrant violation of the provisions of the UN Charter 
and the principles of international law. The EU has joined other groups and institutions in this endeavor to diabolize the image of the Syrian government and the leader of the country and his family. On Wednesday, March 10th, 2021, Mr. Joseph Borrell said at the EP debate that latest data suggests the poverty rate stands at 80% in Syria and the 12 million Syrians, nearly 60% of the population, are severely hit by food insecurity and the pandemic has exacerbated the challenges. This statement condemns Mr. Borrell and the European Union, which has always advocated for human rights. Isn't the EU joining unilateral coercive economic measures and imposing sanctions on Syria to serve the Syrian people? Isn't an economic terrorism? Isn't a crime against humanity and democracy? From the very beginning in 2011, some countries were involved in the crisis in my country, Syria. They used to send and support tens of thousands of terrorists who target the Syrian state and its own people. The danger of these terrorists is no longer limited to Syria, as you know. It now threatens all countries around the world, including Europe itself. For the first time in modern history, a new phenomenon has emerged. We all know that using terrorism as a political weapon was a kind of Western strategy that was implemented in Afghanistan, Nicaragua, Iraq, Bolivia, Iran, Libya, and elsewhere. However, for the first time, a new version of this strategy was created on purpose in the intelligence services laboratories, a new strategy deemed adequate to the Syrian situation. I mean by this that those hostile same governments who launched a terrorist war against Syria claim that they care for the safety and security of the Syrian people. The United Nations system concerned with combating terrorism has persistently ignored the reality of the terrorist war that Syria has been subjected to since 2011. Needless to say that this unbalanced practice was going on as a result of the political and financial polarization practices pursued by the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and France. Those European governments were negatively exploiting their membership in the Security Council against my country, Syria, That's to the maximum extent. Their aim was distorting the facts, demonizing the position of the Syrian government, <laughs> affording political and media coverage for terrorist armed groups, and preventing Security Council from listing those groups and hundreds of foreign fighters as terrorist entities and individuals. The situation reached a degree of rudeness when the US permanent representative and the government of her country during Trump era went on for many, man many months denying the very existence of a well-known terrorist organization in Syria called Al Nusra Front. Let me remind you here that Al Jazeera channel which is owned by the ruling family in Qatar. Al Jazeera Channel correspondent Ahmed Mansour had conducted two long prestigious television interviews with the terrorist Abu Muhammad Al Julani, the leader of Al Nusra Front. It gave him the free of charge platform to promote his terrorist ideology. Recently, Martin Smith, an American journalist, interviewed this terrorist for the frontline program on the PBS. I would like also to remind you that the Qatari delegation to the United Nations has explicitly announced that it opposes the Security Council's decision to list Al Nusra Front organization in the list of terrorist entities. Well, do not be surprised, ladies and gentlemen, that one day these governments will nominate Abu Muhammad Al Julani for the Nobel Peace Prize. 
With the beginning of 2014, the threat of terrorism became widespread in Syria and Iraq. And indications began to appear that the threats of terrorism would not stop within the borders of these two countries as the phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters expanded in a way that threatens international peace and security. The international public opinion, namely in the countries of the EU, started to raise serious questions about the role of the governments of these same countries and their involvement in turning blind eyes on the travel of thousands of hundreds of extremists from the EU to Syria and Iraq to join terrorist groups such, such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Al-Nusra Front. So the magic began to fall back on the wizard. And the terrorist goods that were exported to Syria in particular began to return to the country of origin to pose a threat to European security. This situation coincided with the firm Russian and the Chinese position within the Security Council in the face of the attempts of the United States, the United Kingdom and France to distort the facts about the terrorism that Syria is suffering from, financed and supported by regional governments, foremost among which is Turkey, Qatar and Israel. Thus, the Security Council began to witness moves to adopt many resolutions related to combating terrorism most of which were directly or indirectly linked to the tragic situation in Syria. Actually, the Security Council adopted in, during the last 10 years, and thanks to the Syrian crisis, 23 resolutions on combating terrorism. New languages appeared in the Security Council's resolutions about ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, and Hayat Tahrir al-Sham and their role in spreading terrorism in Syria and Iraq, stealing oil and antiquities to finance terrorism and about foreign terrorist fighters. The Security Council began to address theoretically rather than practically the phenomenon of liberating hostages in exchange for ransom payments to terrorist armed groups. It is the dangerous practice assigned to the Qataris who were financing terrorism directly or indirectly through these ransoms in, in blatant violation of the Security Council Resolution 2133. The Security Council has adopted 23 resolutions, as I said, as I have pointed out, in the field of combating terrorism, linked to the situation in Syria in a way or another. Yet, Regional governments keep on supporting, financing, and facilitating the transfer of terrorists. Hundreds of thousands of terrorists, weapons and money to Syria. In blatant rudeness, they call the terrorist the Syrian armed moderate opposition. They are in their majority foreigners, Chechnyans, Uyghur from China, from Uzbekistan, from Kazakhstan, from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, from Libya, and elsewhere. But they still call them Syrian armed moderate opposition. The Americans, along with other members, prevented the Security Council from listing many terrorist organizations and individuals on the sanctions lists imposed by the Security Council on entities and individuals involved in supporting, arming, financing, and laundering money for the, for the interest of terrorist acts in Syria. As long as terrorism targets Syria, it is halal, it's legal. Terrorism in Syria is legal. Terrorism elsewhere should be punished. The American permanent representative continued for many months, kept denying the existence of a terrorist organization in Syria under the name Jabhat al-Nusra. She kept stating that this group is a myth that the Syrian government invoked in order to justify for itself the suppression of peaceful demonstrations. 
until the US government caved into reality and allowed, along with its allies, the Security Council to list this terrorist organization on the sanctions list at the end of the May, the month of May of 2013. Even when the terrorist group of Al Nusra Front, like Lizard, changed its name to Hayat Tahrir Sham, the US government continued to reject the request of Syria and the Russian Federation to include this new name on the Security Council's list. And it did not approve its listing until the US Treasury Department included Hayat Tahrir Sham in the US sanctions regulations. Isn't it funny? Isn't it, isn't it ironic that they enlist this entity on the Treasury Department list as a terrorist entity, but they prevented from being enlisted on the Security Council list of terrorist entities? I need somebody to explain to me. Currently, the United States continues to obstruct the request of China, Russia, and Syria to list the most dangerous terrorist organization operating in Syria. That includes the most violent foreign terrorist fighters, which is known as Horas al Din. This is another example. In this particular case, hypocrisy has reached an unprecedented level as the US Treasury Department, again, the US Treasury Department has included Horas al Din on the US sanctions list, but it's, it still refuses to list this terrorist organization on the list of the Security Council. We need, uh, we may need Freud here to explain the state of mind, the American state of mind. The Syrian government has documented and authentic authenticated information about the involvement of individuals in the fighting with the terrorist organizations of ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra and Hurras al-Din, after their conditional release from Guantanamo and the imposition of house arrest on them in countries in Latin America. These same governments, most of them are former colonial powers or war mongers, insult the UN Charter and our intelligence by claiming that they are invading parts of Syria under the false flag of Article 51 of the Charter, after Article 51 deals with the self-defense. They resort, the American, the same, these governments, they resort to Article 51 to cover up their misgivings, but they established a so-called international coalition based on unilateral action and without any authority given by the Security Council. People cannot be arsonists and claim at the same time that they are firefighters. Hence, we call on unifying the efforts to fight terrorism in full coordination and cooperation with the Syrian government. This should be done in accordance with the relevant Security Council resolutions and in a way that does not violate the Syrian sovereignty. The insistence of some governments not to abide by the Security Council resolutions through their refusal to take back their national terrorist fighters and their families reveal their deep hypocrisy. Syria is determined to eliminate all remnants of terrorism and to put an end to the phenomenon of cross-border foreign terrorist fighters. Everything should be without border in this world, seemingly. Like Médecins Sans Frontières, doctors without border, nurses without border, clowns without borders, terrorists without borders. Everything should be without borders. In this context, we emphasize on the attempts to interfere in our internal affairs under the pretext of humanitarian aid. We assure our rejection to the Brussels conferences, which is to be held under the slogan of Syrian aid, while the European Union imposes sanctions on Syria, which exacerbate the suffering of the Syrian people. It is an irony to witness the EU imposing criminal unilateral economic coercive measures against Syrian people and claiming at the same time its determination and commitment to help the same Syrian people. 
the Syrian government has always been keen to engage positively in the political track in accordance with its national and constitutional determinants. In this regard, Syria strictly emphasizes on the independence of the Constitutional Committee with the assurance that the political process is owned and led by the Syrian people who have the exclusive right to determine their future without external interference. To that end, we call on the United Nations to play its role as an honest and impartial mediator and to prevent some countries from interfering in the affairs of this committee, imposing their agendas, hidden agendas, or directing suspicious recommendations to the Secretary General's special envoy. Some Western countries are influenced by the United States of America. They keep, an obstruct, they keep on obstructing the political path, politicizing the humanitarian needs and using them as a pretext to achieve their political agendas. They adopt measures as cross-border assistance, which violates the Syrian sovereignty. They keep continuing to promote the so-called Ghazi Antab hub by currently preparing to extend the effects of the Security Council Resolution 2165-2533. Speaking of Ghazi Antab, I invite you to view Snowden's documents that show evidence that this area, Ghazi Antab, has now become the main hub that Turkish authorities use to train terrorist fighters before they are sent to Syria or Libya or Yemen or elsewhere. I would like to say that addressing the humanitarian crisis in Syria will not be achieved through distributing assistance or accusing the Syrian government, wrongly speaking, of being uncooperative, but by lifting the unilateral coercive measures imposed on the Syrian people. Some international humanitarian organizations complain about the lack of funding only increasing the humanitarian assistance with the full coordination with the Syrian government will enhance the UN credibility. Let me conclude, Professor, ladies and gentlemen, with a story, a real story that happened to me when I was permanent representative of my country to the United Nations. In March 2013, the first use of chemical substances happened in a small town in the suburbs of Aleppo called Khan al Asal. It resulted in the death of 23 Syrian soldiers and several innocent civilians. I got instructions from my government immediately to rush to the Secretary General and ask him for assistance to A, verify whether chemical substances were used or not, B, identify the perpetrators. I immediately rushed to the office of the Secretary General at that time, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. It was around six o'clock in the afternoon. I asked him, I conveyed to him my government's instructions. He told me, Mr. Ambassador, give me some time to consult with the big hyenas in the council meaning the P3. I said, okay, I left back, went back to my office. Then I went home. At 11 o'clock in the evening, Mr. Ban Ki-moon calls me and says, Mr. Ambassador, inform your government that after consultation, I will help you, I will assist you in verifying whether the chemical substances were used or not in Khan al -Asr. I said, Mr. Secretary General, what about B? What about identifying the perpetrators? He said, I'm sorry, Mr. Ambassador. I couldn't convince them. I couldn't convince the hyenas and the council to assist you in identifying the perpetrators. That was in March, 2013. Anyway, I said, Agreed. Let us go ahead. 
let us go ahead with only A. Thinking as a diplomat that my answer would be enough to start immediately the UN mission. You know what? It took the Secretary General four months and 11 days to send the mission of experts headed by a distinguished Swedish scientist to Damascus. That was in August 2013. When, when the UN experts were about leaving Damascus for Aleppo, another attack took place in Al Ghuta. Sim simultaneously, coincidentally, but as, as we say in the uh, American serials, incredibly speaking, incredibly speaking, another at chemical attack took place in Al Ghuta. At the same time, at the moment where the team was departing from Damascus to Aleppo to investigate what happened in Khan al-Hassan. Then different instructions came to the team. Don't go to Khan al-Hassan, go to al Ghuta, because it was prefabricated. The attack in al Ghuta was prefabricated to prevent the team, the UN team from going to Khan al-Hassan. And the funny part of the story, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether it is funny or not. The investigation in what happened in Khan al-Asal in March 2013 didn't take place till now. Till now, nobody from the UN or from the OPCW went to Khan al-Asal to tell us what exactly happened over there. I just wanted to conclude with this remark. I'm sorry for being lengthy in my statement, but you know, I represent uh, the concerned, the main concerned party in this conference. We are a victim, ladies and gentlemen. We are a victim. The same way the Iraqis were a victim. The same way the Libyans were a victim. We are also a victim but we will not tolerate or allow anybody to draw our fate or destiny the way they did it to the Iraqis or to the Libyans. I thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the uh, Syrian Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates, Your Excellency, Dr. Bashar al-Jafari, for a most fascinating historical account. In fact, it's a historical document, uh, an international uh, testimony, which has combined um, a multidisciplinary approach um, between, it ranged between history to diplomacy, international relations, political philosophy, as well as international law. This section, Your Excellency, has not ended because we do have uh, three mini sections now to follow. The um, uh, first one would be an intervention by Ambassador His Excellency Michel Rambeau, and the final section will be um, a speech of a vote of thanks by the Right Honourable Baroness Cox. However, there is an exceptional request here, Your Excellency, from the Al Mayadeen TV channel to ask you live now uh, one question, please, if I may. Mr. Moussa Sroor, the London correspondent, is with us. Please, Mr. Moussa Sroor. Uh, thank you very much for letting me ask uh, His Excellency. Uh, I just want to ask a quick question. What is your take on the recent escalation, British escalation, uh, uh, imposing uh, uh, a sanction against the members of the government? Well, thank you very much for raising this uh, uh, very important question. I partly uh, addressed this uh, issue uh, in my statement. Definitely uh, imposing sanctions on the leader of a country, his own family or his own cabinet or some of his own cabinet is not a diplomatic act, is not a political uh, uh, accepted, acceptable uh, act. Especially when these 
so-called sanctions uh, are imposed are are imposed uh, without any legal ground you know that sanctions to be legitimate should be imposed exclusively by the security council not unilaterally not unilaterally the european union is not a universal body to impose sanctions on foreign personalities the european union by imposing sanctions sorry the european union by imposing sanctions on the president his family or part of the cabinet the government is cutting off its legal influence its moral influence its last hair as we say in arabic saying the hair of muawiya as you know they are cutting this last hair instead of establishing bridges diplomacy is the best bridge to solve problems ignoring diplomacy and overcoming international law and avoiding and condoning and ignoring courtesy courtesy is something that should be condemned while we address europe and the european through this esteemed conference we are not here to defame the europeans because we have too many friends in europe we we are, we, we 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 don't generalize we don't generalize when we when we talk about europe about european peoples we don't generalize we have many friends in europe including many esteemed figures in this conference and we have witnessed how positive their inter interventions and statements are but still a question why this biased unjust and very difficult to understand position of the european union against the syrian government didn't europe see what happened to iraq wasn't an injustice what they what the west did to iraq wasn't an injustice what the west did to libya isn't it enough blood in our area for europe and for the americans what would be the benefit for europe to target president assad his family and some of the syrian government's cabinet just i need somebody to tell me what would be the benefit for the european union to cut the bridge with the syrian government why europe is keen interest into becoming the enemy of syria and the syrian people we have enough difficult past with the with europe namely speaking with the former colonial european powers and now the same former colonial powers are monopolizing the diplomatic and political action within the european union they are imposing their own voice on other european nations that won't by all means to reopen their embassies in damascus to reconsider the european union position about the syrian crisis to stop these influential european powers from intervening into our domestic affairs we have many friends in europe we don't have only enemies in europe if europe would like to ignore us we will ignore europe we have alternatives not only us 
even big powers like China and Russia said the same thing. How come the United States and the European Union impose sanctions on President Putin, on the Chinese leaders, on the Iranian leaders? What kind of diplomacy is this? We are, we are in the 21st century. What kind of a diplomacy is this? It is really pitiful and shameful to, to attend this kind of behavior. What can I say, my friend? Thank you for asking this question, but uh, uh, by all means, by all means, this is uh, this decision targeting Syrian uh, officials, high Syrian officials, is not as high as we would like to see Europe. This decision is bringing Europe down, very down in our eyes. Thank you.